it could be as thin as 70 pages, and we have some that are two or three, four, two or three hundred pages. Uh, it just depends on the individual group and author. But each one has a section on identification. This is a, a place where you can look to learn where the engine number is, where the VIN number is, uh, any idiosyncrasies about those. The next section is operation and controls. How are the things supposed to work? Do you turn the ignition switch to the left, or do you need to turn it to the right to turn on, and if vice versa? All those kinds of things so that uh, when we judge operability on the show field, everybody's supposed to know how things are supposed to work in there. Uh, the next section of the manual is about the engine compartment. How does it appear? Not what the specs are for the carburetor, but how does it appear? Is the carburetor dichromate plated with a painted base, or is it finished in some other way? What color is the carburetor air cleaner? Where do the decals go? What kind of radiator cap will you find? What kind of hose? Is the hose black with ribs, or black with GM logos, and those kinds of things? And then we have somebody to turn off their phone <coughs> before they start. Um, the next section is the chassis and the underbody. How is the frame, the suspension, how are, that, how are those things finished? What's the exhaust system like? Uh, for the 40s, 50s, uh, Cadillac, unlike GM, once the chassis was assembled, everybody assembled them the same way. You flip the frame upside down, you put, it, put in the rear end, put on certain other components, flip the chassis over, and put the rest of it back together, drop the engine on, and, and the transmission, and so on. But once the chassis was done, before the engine was made, everything was sprayed with chassis enamel. Whereas in Buick, for example, the frame was painted by A.O. A. O. Smith, and then the various components were put on as they were received from the supplier. Some were painted, some were not. So if you have forged steel on a Buick, it should not be painted black. It should be forged steel. There are paints that try to replicate that kind of thing. The next section in our manual is interior, and that shows you, tells you, most all the manuals have the codes that will enable you to decode from your data plate what's in the car, what was in the car when it came from the factory. And it will show you patterns of how these were finished, generally. If you have a car with a, Fleetwood, a genuine Fleetwood body on it, uh, not necessarily the case that the manual will handle it have all the details because Fleetwood uh, is a whole other story and there are a lot of individual options for customizing a Fleetwood body. If you're going to do a Fleetwood car, you should get Shields book, which is about this thick. It just came out with the second edition and has all kinds of details on how interiors are finished, how the exteriors are finished, which is very valuable and helpful for them. The next chapter, the final chapter in the book is about, in the authenticity manuals, is the exterior. How is it painted? What's the trim look like? Um, when we get back to the 20s and 30s cars, again, there are many, many variations and differences. And so you have to be, uh, and so the manual tries to help you attune yourself to those things. Depending upon the author of the book, there are appendices which will include lists of places that you can get supplies from. Not all manuals will have that. Some will have one or two pages that they've copied out of um, some GM book because it's a idiosyncrasy of that year or, or that particular car that it's nice to know. And, but that's sort of uh, author's choice. What are these books for? And they're intended to be a guide for owners and judges to restore them and to judge the restored car. What they attempt to document is typical practice. What was typical
simply done at the factory when the car was assembled. Corvette people obsess over bolt heads. You know, it has to be, has to have a certain marking line. Well, I can assure you that the assembly line at General Motors for any make never stopped while they waited to get a particular fastener if they ran out of the normal ones that were supplied. They put it together with whatever was available. You want to try and hook it up? I can do it. Okay. <coughs> Hook it up while the show is in progress. Sure can. Okay. What a deal. So we'll let him do that. So the point is that these books attempt to show what was typical practice. But there are variations in typical practice. And if if you are restoring a car, the source that can tell you usually the best source for what how the car was put together is the car itself. Most people rush into a restoration and they take it all apart. Wrong. They also grab a hold of the pressure washer at the local service station, or maybe they have one, and they blast all that grease and everything off. Grease is good, uh, sort of like what the guy said. Greed is good. Well, grease is good because if you have a very greasy, slimed up assembly, the odds are that if you remove that dirt carefully, if you remove that dirt carefully, you will still find the original factory markings. You will find what the finish of the part was, but you can't find it with a steam cleaner and aggressive solvents. Yeah, one of the projects I have in the shop right now is redoing the suspension on a 53 Buick. The underneath side, you couldn't get close to it unless you had a hazmat suit on. <laughs> but once I got it off and cleaned the parts gently, here were all the ink paint marks that were left over from the assembly line when the quality control guys went through and marked it with yellow or orange or blue or green that this assembly had been if I had washed that with heavy duty solvents and steam, all that would have been missed. <clears throat> the other thing that can be done is when you take fasteners apart, if they've never been apart before, the head of the fastener and potentially the fitted side of the nut, if you look at it closely, it will show you whether it's cadmium or black oxide or whatever. Yeah. 
I'll put you yeah. on. Now, I'm I'll upholstery. I'm the 41 upholstery. The upholstery is free. That's the whole reason for the authenticity manuals. Okay, there are the chapters. Everyone is arranged this way. Okay, we're talking about typical practice. These are not, what are, when you buy these, these don't tell you how to do it. You need a shop manual, you need service man bulletins, you need other things. You need general mechanical knowledge. These don't tell you how it, how you put it together. Why should you buy these? So you understand your car. If you like to do judging, we'd love to sell you a whole set because you never know what you're going to judge. So uh, you need a whole set to study up before you come to the meet. But really, they will help you authentically restore your car to the best of our ability. When we're preparing these, we can't get all things correct. And so, as time goes on, like this particular manual that I was holding up, the one for 4849 is the most recent one, recently revised. It's in the second edition. We made a lot of changes. <laughs> and we're still finding things that we can add to that manual to enhance it. So someday there will be a third edition, and we will put all those things in. I come back to my point about if you want the best guide for your car, though, use the car, assuming it's not, assuming it's not uh, a collection of parts that you buy from somebody in three pickup truck loads, 35 cardboard boxes. These are done by a committee of volunteers. Um, we have a team leader. We have at least two of them present, Jay Freese. Jay does the class 13. Duke Gerke is working on one for 59 and 60. Duke, you can stand up so people can know who you are. Any other manual writers that I have here? Jim Eppleson, class 19, oh, yeah, 61, 62. 61, 62. You want to stand up? There you go. We have a team leader. And then depending upon how persuasive he is, we have other people that will help. The rule is we use Cadillac literature, whether that's shop manuals, parts manuals, serviceman bulletins, salesman's bulletins, trim books, everything else. If you get it out of Hot Rod Magazine or Motor Trend, we don't accept that. We also submit them to, as they're being developed, a peer review. We try to find people who don't have the time, don't have the interest in writing, if they would at least take the time to read it and say, oh, I don't agree with the fact that the air cleaner is flat black. It should be semi gloss whatever. And through the review process, we try to arbitrate those so that we get a consensus when we put it in the book that this is what everybody believes is the correct. Sometimes we have 50-50, and so we'll print in the book. Some people think it's this, some people think it's that. Look at your car, decide accordingly, come to a judging session with the documentation. And then they're supposed to go through my review before uh, they go to publication. Here are a list part of the list, we'll get to the next slide, of the existing manuals that are available for purchase. Courtesy of a guy by the name of Tom Young, we have class 2 to 7 and 9 um, are all done. Uh, it's a sort of a heroic, I consider it to be a heroic effort, just one lot, hell of a lot of work. And you can also buy class 2A to seven and nine is one big book, which is 1,200 pages. So if you're working on a lot of cars of that vintage, you might want to just buy the whole book, 1,200 pages. Uh, the next group is uh, the final group of what we have available for sale today. These 
are the manuals that we have people working on. They're in various stages of development. Um, some from, really it boils down to a guy said, I really, I'm going to do this. And to others that are uh, more or less far along. Yes, Tim? On the previous slide, I didn't see the 56 Cadillac. I thought it was in the 54 and 55. Uh, I have to check, Jim. I've got a manual. Does it say 56? Six six. Well, it could be that the guy that made these slides it should have said 54 or 56. And I think you're right. Yeah, it was in the Okay, thank you. I'll have to correct that the next time I update these. Uh, the closest one to publication probably is the 63-64 at the moment, but uh, I've given up making projections about when they're going to be done. Uh, so, anyway, uh, that's what we're working on now. That's not all the models. As we get into the 80s, it's getting progressively worse because of all the different variations and models. So some of the things that you can do to help, if you want to help, is if you have a manual that you're using and you're restoring your car, and you find some things that are not in the manual that you sh think should be in the manual, you should write them down and send them to me. That's the only way we're going to find out about these things often. If you're really interested, why you can join one of the manual committees that on this other group here um, and help inspire, work, do what uh, to get those manuals into completion. And how do you help with manuals? You can write a section, uh, you can be a peer reviewer, or you can be the guy that leads the effort. And that's the end of my slideshow. So uh, for the next 30 minutes, um, we can Say another color that was issued that same year. Would that be sufficient, or it has to be the color that left the factory? In the Cadillac Club, the color of the car may be any color that was offered that year. So, if in in '49, how many colors do we have, Jay? Fifteen. Fifteen colors is the palette that you can use. Okay. Carl? Well, for example, 41 on 60 special, there was about 80 different colors that were delivered. <laughs> okay. So the answer is it's if a color was available. Now, if it's not a color that's listed in a factory publication. The car could have been painted that color. Rosemary pink. In which case, you should have some documentation that that's how the car was delivered and your Fisher body be data plate better say SP under paint. Or be blank. Either <coughs> one. Am I correct on blank or SP? Probably SP. SP is normal, but sometimes I think that SO. SO, special order. Now, you go to the see hunt for a show. They ask you if your car is supposed to be the color. And if you don't have the right color, a lot of judges will tell you that your car is not going to win if you go to the next car. Well, I've been, I've been that way too. Well, the, the only thing we, we can comment on here is what what is done under CLC rules? <clears throat> um, under CLC rules, typically, we don't 
take points off for paint color as long as the paint color is reasonable. And like a lot of other judging items, uh, it, it evolves to the judge's judgment. So if you have a wild pink color on a 1937 Cadillac, it's probably going to be an authenticity deduction. If it is a reasonably muted color, even though it doesn't match the paint code on the tag, chances are the judges are not going to make a deduction. They'll accept it as standard judging practice in Cadillac or South Road. Let's go with the seats. Now, in 41, the seats were all pleated. In 40, they were all plain seats. Now, if you have pleated seats in 40, are points going to come off? If the judge is knowledgeable, has enough authenticity knowledge, uh, that is a, a, a logical deduction. The, the trick is, and the problem is, having enough judges who have studied the authenticity manuals or own the cars of that vintage to where they are that knowledgeable. But in fact, you're correct, there should be a deduction for an incorrect upholstery. Now uh, let's go on the color of the upholstery. Yes, Carl. So you're referring to a limited knowledge of cars you've dealt with. Yes. You get into the factory special orders and everything else, what you're saying no longer holds. No longer holds. Yes. It's something about with the colors. I, I judge NCRS. Right. And I've seen 53 Corvettes, all the white, not one, the same color. Yeah. How authentic? I mean, is there a guide that shows this was a color swatch? And then we add. I, I understand you're talking about variations <laughs> in color. Variations in the same color. Yeah. And it's, it, it's impossible. Uh, yeah. And in the Cadillac Club, it, we just don't bother. Okay, it, if it's if it's a metallic royal, it's it's what the eye can discern. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, so if it's supposed to be a metallic dark blue, and it really is sky blue, well then no, that doesn't work. But if it's a metallic dark blue, whether it's dark dark or a little less dark, yeah. To show you just how impossible that is, I spent a lot of years in production and production engineering in General Motors, particularly in picture body. It was impossible to even match the paint from the front fenders to the body in a lot of cases because picture body painted the body, the motor division painted the front end sheet metal. So at my home plant in Janesville, Wisconsin, we solved the problem by one vendor supplying half of the colors to both Chevrolet's picture body, and the other vendor, one of them was PPG and the other was DuPont, and the other vendor supplied the other half of the colors to both Chevrolet and Fisher body to guarantee that the sheet metal would match the body. In some cases, the difference was extreme to the point that you can't sell this car, and you wind up repainting one half of it. So to be exact on the shade and the metallic flop and, and all on, on paint, no. you can't get there. Yeah, white diamonds. And it's really yeah. hard to match that. Paul, oh, I can go one step deeper. I supply both Ford and Ham, and each year had different color standards. <coughs> the only way you can keep a <coughs>
three or four hundred fabric samples from the early 30s to the early 40s uh, that have been kept in the dark. And those are pretty accurate, but they don't cover the whole ground. That's the only fabric sample collection that is publicly accessible that I know of. Others may have um, fabric swatch books from the dealerships that have been properly kept. And I hope that uh, eventually the archives gets a full collection of, of those. But as you get back long earlier than 1940 or so, those fabric swatches are pretty rare, pretty few and far between. Yeah. I have some, I have a 30 pack, a Rumble Seat Ghost Super 8. Now, in the Rumble Seat Ghost, in the 30 pack of the Super 8, which was the top of the line pack, which equivalent was two cattle. Now, I just changed and I put beige leather into the seats. It came with beige leather, supposedly. Now, you know how many shades of beige leather there is? Yeah. Beige, you you make your own point. The beige leather. You make your own point. I make you my just own can't point. get there from here on exactly. Yeah. Well, and, and between Fisher and Fleetwood, between the two, there was also a variation, variation between the Fisher and Fleetwood. So if you had a custom made by like Mike, I have a V16. It's a really a custom made car. It was made handmade, but they made 10 cars on a V16. So it's a custom made car. How are you going to figure all that kind of different stuff into a V16? Yeah. And, and, and then if, if the fabric color is reasonable and the sew pattern is reasonable for the era, that's what it's accepted. Know. It has to be. Yeah. yeah. Well, Fran Rogers <coughs> has made two. <laughs> made two Cadillac sure with did. Fleetwood bodies based off illustrations in the Fleetwood sales books that were never made. The cars were never manufactured, but he made them, what, 100 years ago? Yeah, 15 years ago. Yeah, 15 years ago. Now, I have a 38 piece. Not, 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 let me go back what? here. Jim had a question. Uh, I just had my car, well, I had it, I think it was five years ago, I had the car painted, PPG paint, and I, I've had the uh, hood out, had a scratch in it, took it in to have it uh, painted. I had the DuPont code, the PPG code, the Ditzler code, the R&M code, and the guy said, we're coming out to scan the car. Right. And what I found out, they tend to like to come out and scan the car, even if they have all the different old codes, because that's really the only way you're going to get it reasonably close to what that 
color is. Now, if, you're, if you're matching paints, we fortunately now have spectrophotometers. Assuming you can get a large enough patch of the paint where you can get where you can get a good shot. It takes the camera, I call the camera, the, the instrument that takes the picture, uh, has an opening that's about so-so around it and a gasket around it. So you've got to have a decent area to, to work with. Well, I had an advantage because mine that got painted five years ago, and I did the clear coat, so it sat inside for four or five years, no fade, no wear. And so he, and the, day I, the, he, the guy absolutely refused to use the coats. He says, for me to get it exact, I'm going to have to come out and scan that right. paint color. Because I'm using DuPont, you use PPG, and even between the PPG and the way they mixed that five years ago, it could be different. Exactly. But going back to the original question, I mean, if you technically took it to the extreme, you could have people out there scanning your cars to see if it come within some kind of, you know, yeah, right. range. Well, we're not going to do that. You're not going to do that. <laughs> if it Relax. looks, yeah. Even the Corvettes don't do that. I mean, no. it's. Yes, uh, they do. Yes, they do. Corvettes change colors in the fiberglass. Yeah. But I wasn't aware that they were using spectrophotometers on the paint. No, I don't know if that no they're trying to get a standardization. Well, I understand. I understand that, that, but it's it's it's, it's very standard. difficult because even in the even in the production year, there were very. I mean, it's not great. But there were variations. You couldn't take an early assembly car and set it alongside a late assembly car and expect the paint to match exactly. But it was close. I mean, polo white is not, you know, gray. Well, you lock them all in a row. Yeah, they're all different. Which one's real? You had a question. Yeah. Uh, in, on one of your uh, previous presentations, you mentioned that you had some issues with And that's three or four more trips around the car. 
and when we get done, you're going to sand them anyway. That's how we make them look nice. And you can, and I used to use, you can't, it's hard to get it anymore, acrylic enamel. And it, with a hardener in that, you can color sand that as well. And that was, that was before reading single stage urethane's got going good. But, but if you use any metallic paint, you have to clear coat. Okay? And the new thing about the waterborne <clears throat> colors is, at least with PPG, you can match color better with a waterborne base coat. They still all use the solvent based clear coats for top. There's no waterborne clear coat on the top. But the biggest problem is changing your mindset in terms of cleaning your gun and what kind of a gun you have to make sure that if you're using waterborne, you have to have all stainless steel. The far bigger problem for me with using waterborne paints is drying. You need good drying equipment to dry the waterborne paints that you can't do. I mean, with solid-based paints, you can paint them in your driveway. You can paint them in a garage with a fan that's just big enough to pull out the vapor so you don't die, assuming you're wearing a face mask and so on. But you really don't need a spray booth as long as you're halfway clean and you're halfway light. And you know how to fix it when the bug falls in. But uh, with waterborne paints, it's a, it's a horse of it, it's different technology, and you really need good drying equipment to, to use those paints successfully. But that's the way that's the way the business is going. And if you follow talk to anybody that's doing uh, high-end hot rods with really fancy paint coats, just the painters, not the guys who build the hot rods, but just the painters, because there's about 15 or 20 of those guys around the country. They're all pretty much going to the waterborne bases because they like the flexibility they get with, with that kind of thing. Okay. Five minutes and then I'm gone. One more question now. Three I, I, can I get the guy in the back who's four. had his hand up, Joe? Just, just one question. Of course, especially I noticed the seventies is going to be coming out in that manual. I know, especially during the seventies, they reserved the Cadillac Reef and Crest for the Fleetwood products. On the V, Cadillac V and the Crest were used on Deville products. You see quite often people who have put wreath and crest hood ornaments, wreath and crest hubcaps, and you see it even at Cadillac shows. Is that something that you're going to deduct? Or because that is an accessory that Cadillac sold, are you going to let that stand? It's not authentic to the cars, but I, I understand what you're saying. We got that. Chief Judge, Deputy Chief Judge, <laughs> <laughs> and they got their hands in their pockets and they're all under the table. It really bothers me when I see it. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I just don't want to get into that. Let me tell you this. <laughs> you're, you're going to weigh in. At the risk of being assassinated. <laughs> Dealers did a lot of things. They put uh, skull cap, vinyl cap, uh, tops on. They put stripes on, they put uh, wreaths around the keyhole, none of which was Cadillac authorized. So what we have tried to do is, is stay with Cadillac authorized stuff. The dealer can pull things off in parts shell. We saw some couple of really nice El Dorados yesterday in the car collection that we viewed, one of which had the Cadillac kind of wreath and crest on the front of the hood, 67 Colorado. And then somebody had taken the front extension of the hood center molding and replaced it with a later one with the upstanding wreath and crest. So you look at the there's mm -hmm. wreath and crest wrong. Despite the fact that the dealer sold a lot of those to the point where the story was, the other, uh, the other 
center molding tips got thrown in a box, and, and somebody said, hey, I got a full box full of those things at home. <laughs> oh, <clears throat> but while the, the parts were on the shelf, Cadillac didn't release them that way. And that really has to be the gold standard. Well, yes, Jay. Well, it's a slightly different situation. In 49, uh, first half a year or so, um, there were no fuel filters, external fuel filters attached to the carburetor. Beginning halfway through the year, they came that way from the factory. They were not an option. The factory just installed them. Must have been some problem. Dealers, from that date onwards, offered them as a retrofit for the earlier cars. So, in the authenticity manual for 49, we said the car, an early car can have a fuel filter, but a later car must have a fuel filter. Uh, even though the earlier ones didn't come that way. And then that's assuming that the people that judge the 49 no, on the no. field uh, are some of those people that understand, you know, maybe yes and definitely yes. No. So, uh, one, of the, one of the situations that exists in the Cadillac Club is when the car is judged, is the knowledge base of the judges that judge your particular car. And Carl tries to assign people to the cars that experience from records should know the cars. But since we do not have judges that we can guarantee will come to this meet, <laughs> we don't necessarily have people that are knowledgeable, knowledgeable about a particular car. And so that's a problem we face. Unlike NCRS, where at every meet, there are people, you can only judge 63s if you are proving yourself to be a 63 knowledgeable person and have been tra trained on 63s. So we, we don't have that luxury, that flexibility in the Cadillac Club. So the thing is, if you've got a judging problem, if you've got a judging problem, you should take it up right on the field with the team captain right at the time. And he should bring to you any significant deductions he's going to make. Yeah, and that's, you, that's a must. Yeah. And you guys, and you guys, the two of you should work it out. And if necessary, get out the books, get out the photos. I mean, I go back to this thing about when I restore a car for a customer, typically there's a photographic record of somewhere between 1,500 and 2,500 photographs. I try to take everything before, during, and, and after as part of the restoration process. And so, you, if there's an issue, we can have a discussion about what's what. So, we're going to turn you over to Craig now, Craig Wood in a minute, and talk about speedometers, I guess. And I thank you for your attention. And I've been, doing, I've been doing this since I was 17. Some cars have been are 75, 80 years old, and they've been through 18 mechanics. So some stuff you can't even go by because 